Hey everybody, this is uh, Dr. Andy Woods here, and welcome to another um, installment of Pastor's Point of View. Today is July, now I have down here the 3rd, but I think today is the 2nd, isn't it? I think it's the 2nd. July the 2nd, 2020. Yeah. Which, me <laughs> which means that July the 4th, Independence Day, is just, you know, right around the corner. And my name is Dr. Andy Woods. I'm back here with my friend, colleague, associate pastor, fellow elder, Dr. Jim McGowan. And I don't know about you, Brother Jim, but I, I feel that every time Independence Day rolls around, it's kind of, um, I, I, my emotions are kind of mixed. Mm. And I think a lot of people feel this way. Yeah. Because in one sense, you're looking backwards to mm -hmm. the heritage that you have. Yeah. And you're thankful for it. Mm. That's true. But then you're looking forward and you're thinking, how long is this going to last? What happened? <laughs> yeah, and what happened? What happened? <laughs> what happened? And today what we're going to talk about, Brother Jim, is what happened. Good. And it's not the fault of the folks out there. Yeah. Because a lot of preachers will say, you haven't done enough, you haven't voted enough, yeah. you haven't yeah. prayed enough. Now, there's always room for improvement. We do need to pray and vote and all that stuff. Sure. But th there was a change that was made to our Constitution by judicial fiat in 1962, 1963, which single-handedly took our country from its Judeo-Christian foundation mm -hmm. and, with the stroke of a pen, moved it onto the shifting sands of humanism, yeah, which is where right. we find ourselves uh, today. And I don't know of another, I don't know how to say it more nice, nicely, so I just came out and said what was on my mind. I call this the big lie. I don't know how to be more diplomatic like about it. I mean, this probably, of all the, the cultural lies out there, this may be the top one. The big lie, and what we're going to be talking about today is the separation between church and state, or the so-called high and impregnable wall <laughs> of separation between church and state. Yeah. Boom, that comes into a Supreme Court decision yeah. in 1962 and then 1963, and then subsequent courts who, who at the federal level aren't accountable to the voters, built on that, and our mm -hmm. whole country has been transformed yeah. without us being able to say or do anything about it. Right. So that's right. the direction, you know, in which we go. And everybody knows, you know, at least they should know, that the Supreme Court is totally out of control. Yeah, that's right. You know, here we are at the end of the term, their term in June, and we just got two terrible decisions. Yeah. One of them we covered... <clears throat> rewrote the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to accommodate transgenderism yeah. and the same-sex lifestyle, sexual orientation. And another one just came out where they uh, once ag again struck down a very reasonable restriction on abortion. Yeah. You know, in this case, making sure abortion providers are registered at hospitals yeah. or Imagine licensed at, at hospitals. Yeah. And what we're and again, everybody wants that, except the Supreme Court came in and said that's unconstitutional, mm -hmm. based on some right in the Constitution to have an abortion, which isn't there. Yeah, and that's the situation that we have, find ourselves in. We're mm -hmm. a, a completely out of have a completely out of control Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and this is nothing new, uh, as we're going to show. They cr created an expression. In 1962, 1963, we'll tell you exactly where that expression comes from. It's called the strict wall of separation between church and state. And that metaphor, which Rehnquist, I'll show you at the end, calls a misleading metaphor. Mm -hmm. That metaphor has been used more than any other single expression to yeah. remove the United States from its Judeo-Christian yep. underpinnings onto the shifting sands of secular humanism. Now, my mother was reared here in the Houston area. I don't know if you knew that. No, she went that. She went to Lamar High School, wow. fa fairly local. And she told me um, that her teacher, when she was very young, used to sit up in front of the classroom 
and start each school day by reading in a public school excerpts from the Psalms. Right. Now, when she explains that to me, you know, I was born in 1966. That is a that is a world that is so foreign to the one I grew up in, mm -hmm. in the public school system that I went through, because that was taboo. I was told that the founding fathers were against that, mm -hmm. and so what we're exploring is what in the world happened. I came in on the end of that. The end of it. Yep. So I still, when I was in elementary school, they were still doing that. Okay. So you remember yeah. your your I, teacher? I do remember it. All right. Yep. So what moved us from that to what we have now? And we've been in now what everybody's calling the new normal for so long <laughs> that we think America's always been like it is today. Yeah. But if you go back to a Supreme Court decision called the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States in 1892, the Supreme Court, not a right-wing website, <laughs> yeah. the Supreme Court declared the United States of America to be a Christian nation in a unanimous decision. That's mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling. <laughs> so what was the conclusion wow. of that court? Do you mind reading that to I'd us? I'd love to read this. Uh, this is a quoting the Church of the Holy Trinity versus U.S. Quoting, This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation. These are not the sayings, declarations of private persons. They are organic utterances. They speak the voice of the entire people. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation, close quote. Now, they reached this conclusion after citing 87 historical precedents, wow. beginning with Christopher Columbus and how he was reading the book of Isaiah, mm -hmm. and that's what gave him the incentive to come to the United States. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's just unknown, unknown history. So what happened to us? Well, the answer relates to this strict wall of separation between church and state. Now, before we get into this, mm -hmm. I want to say this, that we believe that church and state are separate sovereigns. Mm -hmm. uh, God gave one function to the government, which is to restrain evil, Romans 13, 1 through 7. Yeah. He gave a different assignment to the church, which is to fulfill the Great commi Commission, mm -hmm. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. So if that's all they meant by it, I'd be happy with it. But what yeah. has happened is this expression has been used to say, if you're a Christian and if you have a Christian worldview, you, you can have no say whatsoever yeah. over the direction of your own government right. in the United States. And that's what the founders purged uh, in our founding documents. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's what's meant by this. And this whole thing starts with a case called Ingle versus Vital. Or I think you pronounced it Vitali. Uh, uh, I gave it the little Italian. Yeah, you know. your your pronunciation is probably right. 1962, <laughs> and it dealt with <clears throat> this particular prayer, which used to be prayed in the public schools. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't you read that prayer? Tell me how jihadist folks yeah. you yeah. think this is. Is this? I mean, how dangerous is a prayer like this? All right, let's find out here. Quoting. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Close quote. Not very dangerous to, to my mind. Well, they would have stopped us after the word Almighty. Yes. So this is, notice you notice it's a non-denominational prayer. It was non-compulsory. You could opt out of it. That's right. It was voluntary. It's, what, 22 words, and it took 10 seconds to read. And the Supreme Court stepped in in 1962 and said that violates the separation yeah. between church and state. Now, that's the beginning of the end, because all the other cases that came after that built on that ruling. Yeah. And then along mm. came uh, Abington Township versus Shemp. One year later, 1963, this dealt with not prayer, but Bible reading. Mm -hmm where a student could actually go in front of the class, read an excerpt from the Bible to start the school day. Mm -hmm. It was voluntary. The student could read any version of the Bible they wanted to. Mm -hmm. It was There was no um, commentary given. 
There were no sermons given. It's like just getting up and reading a proverb or something like that. Sure. Something out of the Sermon on the Mount. Pow, 1963, one year later. Can't do that anymore yeah. uh, because of the strict wall of separation between church and state. And all of the subsequent rulings have built on those two. Mm. So what we're going to try to show you today, and most people will never <clears throat> learn this history. Most That's attorneys right. don't know this history because yeah. what we're covering today is not covered in law schools. <laughs> That's crazy. We're going to go through nine reasons, and here is slide one giving reasons one through four, and there's our next slide giving reasons five through nine. That's our outline, and we're going to go through this somewhat methodically because it takes uh, that type of thing to unroot a cultural lie. Mm -hmm. And we're going to tell you why this strict wall of separation between church and state is 100% bogus. It is 100% historical fiction. Right. I mean, you might as well believe Jack and the Beanstalk, yep. you know, That's right. if you're going to believe this stuff as well. So are you good with where we're going? Let's do it. All right. Reason number one, why this strict wall of separation between church and state is nonsense and why those two decisions in 1962 and 1963 are nonsense decisions. Number one, in 1962 and 1963, the Supreme Court of the United States read words into the First Amendment, where allegedly this strict wall of separation between church and state comes from, read words into the First Amendment that are not there. Hmm. So if we have here a copy of the First Amendment, and do you mind reading what that says? All right. Quoting, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, close quote. So that's the religion clause of the First Amendment, and you'll notice it has two parts to it. Mm -hmm. There's two clauses here. The first is what's called the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. It's describing what Congress can't do. So Congress cannot establish a religion. Mm -hmm. And as we'll be showing you today, when they said that, they were talking about a denomination. Right. In other words, they didn't want this country <clears throat> to be a Presbyterian country, a Methodist country, mm -hmm. a Baptist country, but they had no problem, and we'll historically demonstrate this today, that they had no problem with the what we would call the uh, transcendent, transdenominational Christian principles mm -hmm. being observed in public life. Right. That, that was no problem for them. Mm -hmm. But everybody interprets that to mean no Christianity whatsoever, and that's not what they meant. But that's called the Establishment Clause. And you'll notice it also says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Mm -hmm. Now that's called the Free Exercise Clause, meaning the government can't stick its claws into the church. Yeah. And so that's your First Amendment. Now, you'll notice here, Brother Jim, in the Establishment Clause, because the 62-63 decisions read a strict wall of separation between church and state into the Establishment Clause. Hmm. I don't see that there. Well, do you see the word strict? No. No. Do you see the word wall? No. No. Do you see the word separation? No. No. Do you see the word church? No. No. Do you see the word state? I do not. No. Other than that, I guess they're close, right? <laughs> Not there, folks. <laughs> and so where did this whole thing come from? It's If someone's going to run the around... The devil, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, truly. If someone's going to run around and talk about a strict wall between separation of church and state, that's antithetical to mm -hmm. America's founding documents. You know where that concept comes from, shockingly? Well, before we get to that, notice this uh, New York... Uh, I believe this was the New York Supreme Court in 1958... And notice what they said concerning this strict wall of separation between church and state. All right. Quoting, Much has been written in recent years concerning Thomas Jefferson's reference in 1802 to a wall of separation between church and state. It has received so much attention that one would almost think at times that it is to be found somewhere in our Constitution. Close quote. Well, that's the New York Supreme Court. That's fascinating. Everybody's talking about this so much that I guess 
you would think it was in there somewhere, but there, but it's not in there. So wow. where does it where does it come from? You know where it comes from, mm. brother Jim? It comes from the former Soviet Union. Oh, great! <laughs> Here is Article One Twenty Four mm. of the Soviet Union Constitution, and there you'll find mm. the strict wall of separation between church and you state. Sure will, but not in the American First Amendment. You mind reading that? All right, quoting. In order to ensure, I'm, I'm, folks, I really wanted to read this with a Russian accent, but I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to do it. In order to ensure to citizens freedom of conscience, the church in the USSR is separated from the state and the school from the church, close quote. So there's the separation of church and state, not in yeah. the United States Constitution. Not an American flag. But yeah, in the yeah. former Soviet Union Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, on January the 10th, 1963, the same year, hmm. as our decisions we're talking about here came out, Congressman Albert Herlong from Florida read the list of 45 communist goals for America into the congressional record. And if you want some holiday reading, Google that and find these because everything that's happening in the news, you'll find on that list of 45. Right. Right down to defunding the police. Surprise, it's, surprise, right? And number 28 <laughs> on the list reads as follows, communist goal. Eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principle of separation between church and state, mm -hmm. thereby replacing belief in the Creator with belief in the earthly man-controlled state. Mm -hmm. But you'll, if you look at number 28, they said that in 1963, January 10th, and that's what, what the Supreme Court at that moment was doing. Wow. I mean, they must have been just beside themselves, you know, how successful... They, they are as Goodness. communists. Yeah. So that's someone trying to expose communism by reading their goals into the, the congressional record. So mm -hmm. the separation of church and state is pure Soviet. It's pure communism. Yes. It's pure, you know, the former Soviet Union. It is, it's nothing to do with the United States of America. Yes. Yet the Supreme Court in 1962-63 based its ruling on this strict wall of separation, you know, between church and state. Well, if it doesn't come from the Constitution, where does it come from, Brother Jim? Mm. Well, it comes from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1802. Now, we have a little problem. The Constitution was adopted in 1787. Mm -hmm. The Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, was adopted in 1789. So to get the strict wall of separation between church and state, they've got to go 10 years, more than 10 years, into the future hmm. to grab a letter from Thomas Jefferson. And guess what, Brother Jim? Thomas Jefferson wasn't even there when the Constitution was adopted and ratified. Hmm. How do we? He was America's <laughs> ambassador to France yeah. at the time. Yeah. And how do we know that? Hmm. Well, he says that in his, one of his letters... Here's his letter to Joseph Priestley in 1802. All right. So in 1802, he wrote, uh, One passage in the paper you enclosed me must be corrected. It is the following. And all say, it was yourself more than any other individual that planned and established it, that is, the Constitution. He goes on to say, I was in Europe when the Constitution was planned, and never saw it till after it was established. Close quote. So to get this wall, they're going 10 years or more into the future hmm. from the time the First Amendment was adopted, and they're quoting a guy who wasn't even present. Wow. Does it, I mean, you know, we, wow. talk, we talk a lot in Protestant evangelical mm. Christianity about how cults twist mm -hmm. the Scripture. Yeah. The, what, what the Supreme Court did here, we'll demonstrate this, would, would put any cult to, sh to shame. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they have twisted and manipulated everything mm -hmm. to get America to go in the direction yeah. that, that they, they've always wanted it to go in. Yeah. And you, Mr. and Mrs. America, had absolutely nothing to do with it. Mm. You had no influence over this at all. Your country was stolen from you. Mm. 
probably while while we were out barbecuing and having a great time. Right, celebrating the fourth. Yeah. yeah. All right, number two, second reason why those 62, 63 decisions are a complete historical fabrication. Number two, the Supreme Court of the United States took Jefferson, who wasn't there, yeah. and they're relying on something he wrote over 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Even so, they took what he wrote there um, completely out of context. Because Thomas Jefferson was great with as I explained before, the trans-denominational generic principles of Christianity in public life. What he was mm -hmm. against was denominationalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have this quote here from, uh, I believe his first name is Stephen, Stephen Mansfield, a book I'd recommend to you called Ten Tortured Words, and he kind of summarizes what Thomas Jefferson did. All right, quoting. It was Jefferson, after all, who approved funds for evangelizing Native Americans. We don't hear about that, do we? Never. It was Jefferson who attended church on federal property for most of his administration, approved still other churches on federal property, and even ordered the Marine Band to play in his church. <laughs> Close quote. Could you imagine if... Uh... Our president today ordered the Marine Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, does this sound like a guy that's hostile <clears throat> to Christianity? Um, and everybody imputes to Jefferson some kind of secularist agenda. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that he addressed that while he was alive. They were trying to do this to him. Mm -hmm. And here's uh, something he wrote to Benjamin Rush, who was another signer of the Declaration of Independence. Yes, all right. Quoting, My views, this is Jefferson, My views are the result of a life of inquiry and reflection and very different from the anti-Christian system imputed to me by those who know nothing of my opinions. That's pretty clear, yeah, isn't it? Yes. To the corruptions of Christianity, I am indeed opposed, but not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. Hold on, folks. He says, I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others. His system of morals, if, if filled up in the style and spirit of the rich fragments he left us, would be the most perfect and sublime that has ever been taught by man. Close quote. Wow. And it goes on in the next page. Wow, that's amazing. Keep going. Here we go. Speaking he's, of Jesus. He's still talking about Jesus here. His moral doctrines were more pure and perfect than those of the most correct of the philosophers, gathering all into one family under the bonds of love, charity, peace, common wants, and common aids. A development of this head will invince the peculiar superiority of the system of Jesus over all others. The precepts of philosophy and of the Hebrew code laid hold of actions only. He pushed his scrutinies into the heart of man, erected his tribunal in the region of his, of his thoughts, and purified the waters at the fountainhead." Close quote. Wow. See, the reason, the, it's stunning. Wow. The reason the left has focused on Jefferson in this is because he's the least Christian one they could find. Yeah, oh, oh, well, they must not have read this. Well, you know, he calls himself here a real Christian. <laughs> yes, he does. He says Jesus stands out beyond any other philosopher because he put God. his morals into men's hearts. I mean, to me, he sounds like a flaming right winger. He does to me, too. And if this is the least religious they could find, what about those other guys? What about Patrick Henry and all the rest exactly. of them? Exactly. I mean, they must have been, you know, Jesus yeah. freaks completely. Yeah, that's right. You know, I don't know where Thomas Jefferson... Out on the beaches in sandals and long hair, right? <laughs> I don't know where Thomas Jefferson stood with the Lord, but the fact of the matter is he doesn't come across to me like a man that's hostile to Christianity. Not at all. Uh, whatsoever. In fact, it was Thomas Jefferson who gave us the Declaration of Independence <laughs> yeah. in 1776. Mm. Now, Thomas Jefferson is the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, which is America's yes. birth certificate, yes. which is what we're celebrating in a couple of days, yes. 1776. Although he was not 
in the country at the time the Constitution, right. 1787, and the Bill of Rights, 1789, was ratified, debated, and yeah. adopted. Yeah. But when you look here <clears throat> at this list, Declaration of Independence, I mean, it's clear he anchored our rights in God. Yes. The laws of nature, nature's God, were created equal, endowed by our Creator, with certain inalienable rights. He talks about the supreme judge of the world, yep. divine providence. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have God, you don't have the United States, mm -hmm. according that, that's to right. uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. So what they've done mm -hmm. is they've grabbed a letter that he wrote, as I mentioned before, to the Danbury Baptists in Connecticut in 1802. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, I got an email from somebody, and he said he went to a Baptist church in Danbury, Connecticut, and I emailed him back and I said, is that somehow related to the famous church that Thomas Jefferson, you know, wrote to mm -hmm. in 1802? And he said, that's us. Wow. I'm, I'm part of their spiritual lineage. So apparently this church is still, still there, huh? still in existence. Wow. But they were very worried about the government sticking its hand into their affairs. Baptists, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. They've been mistreated mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of places. That's why I think Roger Williams went and founded, what was it, Rhode Island, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, yeah, right. to, to mm -hmm. kind of escape uh, denominational yeah. tyranny against the Baptists. So Jefferson became president, and they were, like, worried, um, you know, is the government going to... Jefferson was Anglican. He wasn't a Baptist. Is the government going to stick its hand into our church affairs? Mm -hmm. And this is where the separation of church and state comes from, from this 1802 letter. So you mind reading that? So it's in a letter, not anywhere in the Constitution or nope. the Declaration. Nope. Okay. And it was written 12, <clears throat> you know, over 10 years after. Yes. All right. Quoting, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between a man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith, or his worship, and that the legislative powers of government reach action only and not opinions, I contemplate with solemn reverence the act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state, close quote. So he wrote to him and said, don't worry about the government interfering with your church life. Mm -hmm. There's a strict wall of separation between church and state. That's where the phrase comes right. from. Right. Now you'll notice that Jefferson applied it, remember the two clauses of the First yes. Amendment? Not to the Establishment Clause, mm -hmm. but to the Free Exercise Clause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how that expression was always used in American jurisprudence prior to 1962 and 1963. In fact, there's a case called Reynolds versus the United States, 1878, dealing with can the state regulate Mormon polygamy. Mm. And they quoted this letter, but again, when they analyzed that situation, uh, they applied it not to the Establishment Clause, but to the Free Exercise Clause. Mm -hmm. Now, what the court did in 1962-1963, Ingle and Abington, they took that phrase and now they applied it to the Establishment Clause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they did something that, number one, the letter isn't speaking to, mm -hmm. and number two, they did something that no court had ever done before. So. The second problem with these decisions is the Supreme Court of the United States in 1962 and 1963 completely took out of context That's what issue. Jefferson said. Yeah. Now, why would they do that? Because they have an agenda. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And feel free to say anything if you... <laughs> uh, this is the kind of thing... I'm the holding back. Well, isn't this the kind of thing the cults do? Well, Yes. Yes, Rip exactly. things out of context. Right. Isn't this what Satan does when Satan, you know, is quoting scripture to Jesus in Luke yep. 4, he's ripping scripture out of context. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So this takes us to number three. Mm. The third problem with these 62, 63 decisions is the Supreme Court of the United States ignored <laughs> the legislative mm. activities of those who passed the First Amendment. So the way to figure out what a law means is you ask yourself, the people that debated that law and passed that law, what did they themselves do in terms of their behavior? 
Oh, you're just narrow-minded, Pastor. <laughs> That's too narrow. We need a flexible, living, growing, evolving yeah, document. Yeah. So if you're interested in authorial intent, you, <laughs> which you, you should be, which you should be, you ask yourself: the people that passed the law, what did they do? Because it's highly unlikely that they would pass a law and then the next day break their own law. Exactly. So I've yeah. got a weird interpretation of it that goes against their behavior. I'm not dealing with authorial intent anymore. Mm -hmm. So the same crowd that passed the First Amendment also gave us the Northwest Ordinance. Hmm. They gave us Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance, Northwest Ordinance, which says... Here's what it says, quoting... Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Close quote. So how do we encourage religion and morality? It's interesting. They, does, they don't say churches hmm. shall forever be encouraged. They say schools and means of education shall forever be encouraged. Interesting. So it's obvious from what they themselves passed that they didn't intend to wipe Christianity they wanted to wipe denominationalism out of the public square, right. but not Christianity. Right. Exactly. Because the, sa the same crowd that gave mm -hmm. us the Establishment Clause gave us the Northwest mm -hmm. Ordinance. Yeah. And, of course, that whole generation came out of the War of Independence, and there's a picture of the Liberty Bell. Mm -hmm. And on the Liberty Bell is a scripture inscribed there. Did you know what scripture is inscribed there on the Liberty Bell? Tell me. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10, which says, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land to its inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have a problem with the scripture on the Liberty Bell. Mm -hmm. So why would they have a problem, you know, with... Uh, wh why, did, why doesn't those strict role of separation of church and state, why did, if that's how they understood it, mm -hmm. why didn't they purge that verse off the Liberty Bell? I agree. And, and one comment I would make <laughs> on this. It says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. Hmm. Seems like we have some issues that are happening in our society today where people are claiming that they don't have rights and liberties and such, and yet the very founding fathers were Amen. promoting liberties for all. That's exactly right. And that same crowd that gave us the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause also gave us paid chaplains in the military and in Congress and Chief Justice Warren Burger in a case called Lynch versus Donnelly draws our attention to that. This is pretty fascinating. I mean, if they believe in a separation of church and state, how could they do that? Exactly. Well, let's read what he has to say here. A significant, quoting, a significant example of the contemporaneous understanding of that clause is found in the events of the first week of the first session of the first Congress in 1789. The first week? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In the very week that Congress approved the Establishment Clause as part of the Bill of Rights for submission to the states, it enacted legislation providing for paid chaplains for the House and Senate. It is clear that neither the 17 draftsmen of the Constitution, who were members of the First Congress, nor the Congress of 1789, saw any establishment problem in the employment of congressional chaplains to offer daily prayers <laughs> in the Congress, a practice that has continued for nearly two centuries. It would be difficult to identify a more striking example of the accommodation of religious belief intended by the framers." Close quote. What a great quote. Yeah. There. So this crowd mm. came mm. from the Liberty Bill mindset with the scriptures inscribed on it. Mm -hmm. They gave us the Northwest Ordinance, which promotes religion and morality in schools. Mm -hmm. And they also gave us chaplains the, the very first week in which they were in session. It's the same group that gave us the Establishment Clause. Yeah. So how do I know what the Establishment Clause doesn't mean? By just looking at the behavior of those that adopted it. Exactly. Common Rather, sense. Common sense. Now, Joseph Story wrote some influential um, commentaries on our Constitution. Let me tell you who Joseph Story was. Joseph Story uh, lived from 1779 to 1845. 
He was appointed by the Supreme Court to the Supreme Court by James Madison. He was on the Supreme Court from 1811 to 1845. He is considered the founder of the Harvard Law School and was a professor there from 1829 to 1845. He authored numerous legal works, is considered one of the most prolific judicial writers. In fact, of his 34 years on the Supreme Court, he authored 286 cases, of which 269 were reported as the majority opinion of the court. His, American, wow. his contributions to American law have caused him to be called the father of American jurisprudence. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this guy's like the old E.F. Hutton commercial. Yeah, E.F. Right. Hutton talks, people listen. Yeah. When Joseph Story <laughs> comments on the founding era, we better pay attention. Yeah. And this is what he says in his um, commentaries mm -hmm. on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. All right, quoting, probably at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and of the amendment to it now under consideration, that would be the First Amendment. The one we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. The general, if not the universal sentiment in America was that Christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state so far as it was not incompatible with the private rights of conscience and the freedom of religious worship. And uh, any, or rather, an attempt to level all religions and to make it a matter of state policy to hold all in utter indifference would have created universal disappropriation, if not universal indignation. Close quote. So Joseph Story said those at the time the First Amendment was mm -hmm. adopted, they believed Christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to lower Christianity to just one of many religions, that would have been met with universal, you know, indignation. Wow. So here, this is the secularist wow. view. Well, that's sure, certainly not what we're seeing today. Not is at it? all. Not at all. Um, this is the secularist view. Yeah. The secularist view is mm -hmm. they passed the First Amendment, which in the Establishment Clause gave us a strict wall of separation between church and state. And then they went and violated their own rule. That's what, that's what they want us to believe. Yeah, That's yeah. the logic of the secularist view. That's the logic of what the Supreme Court said in 1962 and 1963. Mm. So that's why I say number three, the court ignored the legislative activities of those who authored the First Amendment. Number four, now here's where you got to put your thinking caps on <laughs> just a little bit. Okay. Number four, the Supreme Court of the United States in 1962-1963 applied the First Amendment to the states, although the First Amendment was only designed as a limitation on federal power. Now, Gosh. we live in the United States under what is called federalism. Federalism is the idea of two governments, independent governments, operating over the same geographic expanse. So we have our national government, mm -hmm. and then we have the individual state governments, mm -hmm. and those are two different systems. Mm -hmm. But they're, mm -hmm. they operate under, over the same expanse, North mm -hmm. America. Okay. All right. The Tenth Amendment says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited to it by the states are reserved to the states. Mm -hmm. So the states can do whatever they want as long as they're not interfering with the federal government's enumerated powers mm -hmm. in the Constitution. Uh, the Federalist Papers are very clear on this. Notice Federalist <clears throat> Paper number 45. What does uh, that say? All right. Quoting Alexander Ham. These are by Anna Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. Quoting, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Wow. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite, close quote. Which is exactly what the Tenth Amendment says. I mean, this is just reversed from today. It is. It is. Um, wow. Now, you were talking about the Federalist Papers. Federalist Papers were written, as you said, by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay mm -hmm. to convince the New York laity to accept the Constitution. So the Federalist Papers are a tremendous source of light. They're published in the New York newspapers. 
uh, tr uh, in terms of what the Constitution actually means. So right. they're outlining federalism. The reason our forebears were into federalism is they had a view of human nature involving depravity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say here, we wouldn't have to do this if men were angels. <laughs> Federalist Paper Number Fifty One. Yeah. They were yeah. following Lord Acton, who wisely said, "All power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely." Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to divide power up. Smart. Now, why is that? Stephen Mansfield, in his book Ten Tortured Words, tells us. All right, quoting. When the founding generation of Americans turned to the business of creating a country, they had just fought a war against a centralized and controlling government. They had no intention of creating an American version of the same evil, close quote. So we're not going to have just another Britain that we, right. we just fought a war to get rid of or gain independence from. Yeah. So they were into the division of power, and so they divided up between federal and state power. Yes. Now, look very carefully at the First Amendment. <clears throat> what does it say there? Look at that first word. We've got it blocked off there or highlighted. It says, concerning the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, it says, Congress, Congress. shall make no law respecting a freedom of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So of our two layers of government, it's very clear that the First Amendment was a restraint not on the states, mm -hmm. but the federal mm -hmm. government. Yes. In fact, Chief Justice mm -hmm. John Marshall, our third Chief Justice to the United States Supreme Court in a case called Barron v. Baltimore, 1833, was very clear that the Bill of Rights is a restraint on the feds only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm not the individual state governments. All right. So what does that say? All right, quoting, The Constitution was ordained and established by the people of the United States for themselves, for their own government, and not for the government of the individual states. Therefore, the Bill of Rights contains no expression indicating an intention to apply them to the state governments. Close quote. Pretty clear. Yeah, right First there. Amendment and the Bill of Rights, which would be all ten amendments, have nothing to do with the state governments, but only a limitation on federal power. Mm -hmm. So how did how does how did it start to get applied to the states? Well, over time, what happened is they passed the Fourteenth Amendment, and the Fourteenth Amendment mm -hmm. says, "Well, why don't you go ahead and read that?" Well, let me read it. All right, Qu uh, quoting. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws." Close quote. See where it keeps saying no state, no state, no state. Now, mm -hmm. this was passed in 1866, mm -hmm. roughly. This is a post-Civil War amendment Yes. designed to protect the rights of recently emancipated slaves. Yes. Now, this is binding on the states, mm -hmm. this, this amendment, the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment. So what happened is slick lawyers and judges began to take the whole Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, mm -hmm. and start gradually applying them to the states through a process called incorporation. Hmm. So that's why today the Bill of Rights is applicable to the state governments, although it was never originally intended as such. Hmm. Now, in 1947, there was a bomb. I would call it a ticking time bomb was put on the books. It hadn't de detonated yet. But the rubric was in place for the Supreme Court in 1962 and 1963 to come along and exploit this language and then the bomb went off mm. and the whole country changed uh -huh. and we're suffering the ill effects today mm -hmm. 
But here is the ticking time bomb that was put into place in 1947, which would be, what, 16 years or so before our 62, 63 de uh, decisions that we're critiquing. And here is the ticking time bomb. It's a case called Everson versus Board of Education. And it dealt with uh, a case that came out of New Jersey. It dealt with a Ro Roman Catholics that would take their kids out of public school, you know, for the afternoon or whatnot, send them to the Catholic church mm -hmm. for parochial Catholic training, mm -hmm. send them back to the public schools, and then ask the public schools to reimburse them for their travel expenses. Mm -hmm. And this was critiqued and analyzed by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ultimately upheld this. But in the process, they used extremely broad language, which is the ticking time bomb mm. that finally went off in 1962, mm. 1963. And just if you can mm. read the holding there. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Quoting, in the words of Jefferson, the clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. The First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach, close quote. So they put the legal standard in place by which they would analyze this, uh, you know, program of, you know, Catholic kids going to Catholic church and coming back into the public school and getting reimbursed. Yeah, this is a little slick because they write in the words of Jefferson, but they don't mention where those words were found. Exactly. They make it, they, they, they presume on the ignorance of the people. That's right. Right? That, oh, well, this must be in the Constitution somewhere. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. Here's, what, here's the ticking Yikes. time bomb. Number mm -hmm. one, they took the separation of church and state concept, which had only been applied thus far to the free exercise clause mm -hmm. of the two amendments and the uh, two clauses in the religion aspects of the First Amendment. Separation, strict wall of separation of church state was only free exercise from this point. Mm -hmm. They now took it and said, let's apply it to the establishment clause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing they did mm. is they took the First Amendment and the establishment clause, which had only been a restriction on the feds, mm -hmm. and they now yeah. applied it to the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So they did a they 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 did two really big things here in 1947, mm. uh, game changers. Mm. Now ultimately they upheld the tuition reimbursement, but they put the legal uh, what what's the word I'm looking for the legal analysis in place, the legal standard in place, mm -hmm. whereby they would analyze future cases, and so if you were to put your ear to the ground in 1947, you would hear a time bomb ticking. So they set a precedent. Yeah, it hadn't gone off yet mm -hmm. because the arrangement in 1947 was upheld. Yeah. Well, in 1962 and 1963, the court took this standard, mm -hmm. applied it to volitional prayer, mm -hmm. volitional Bible reading, and disestablished them, and pow, America. Wow has never been the same mm. since. Mm -mm -mm. Now, here's what's interesting, Brother Jim. The guy mm. that wrote that decision in 1947 is a guy named Hugo Black. And he's very important for two reasons. Number one, his incompetence. Mm. And number two, his connection to the KKK. <laughs> See, how many people know this history? <laughs> Almost nobody knows this. But what... Mansfield, oh. in his book, Ten Tortured Words, talks about Hugo Black's incompetence. Mm. Go ahead and read that. Let me read it. Quoting, his opinions sounded like Senate speeches <laughs> and were unevenly reasoned. Justice Harlan Fisk Stone complained openly about Black to members of the press and even wrote Felix Frankfurter at Harvard Law School suggesting that he give Black some needed <laughs> tutoring, close quote. Could you imagine that? A sitting justice of the wow. Supreme Court being suggested for remedial tutoring. Now here's Ooh. something else about Black. And his name mm. Black actually fits mm. because he was a uh, gr grand dragon, if I have it right, 
of the KKK. Wow. Now, the KKK, and this comes from a book by a legal scholar named Philip Hamburger, Separation of Church and State, page 427. Think about this for a minute. If you're a member of the KKK or a former member, what two groups of people do you hate? Actually, what three groups of people do you hate? Number one, you hate Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two, you hate blacks. Yeah. And number three, you hate Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. yeah. The release time situation in New Jersey involved the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the reason why he created this language out of whole cloth, because mm -hmm. of his own bigotry. Mm -hmm. And what does Philip Hamburger say mm -hmm. concerning Justice Hugo Black? All right, quoting Jim Esdale, a grand dragon of the Klan and Klan colleague of Hugo Black, noted that, quote, Hugo could make the best anti-Catholic <laughs> speech you ever heard, close quote. See, and I find this very interesting wow. because we're, because we're living justice. in this society where everybody wants to topple all these statues down because of racism. And, mm -hmm. Well, how, where's, how come they're not going after Hugo Black? Mm -hmm. Well, because Hugo Black is a darling of the left. Mm -hmm. Because Hugo Black put into motion the language of a strict wall of separation of church and state wow. that was going to be exploited in wow. 1962 and 1963. This wow. is the guy that took Jefferson's words and mm. took them out of context and applied them to the Establishment Clause. And this is the guy that took the First Amendment religion clauses and didn't keep them contained at the federal level, but mm -hmm. applied them to the state level. Wow. This is the guy responsible for almost mm. everything that has gone wrong in our society, and yet how many people know this history? Well, that's exactly right. Very few. So this takes us to number five on our list. Not only did the Supreme Court of the United States apply the First Amendment to the states, but the Supreme Court of the United States ignored the original intent of the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment where it keeps saying no state, no state, no state. Mm -hmm. That's talking about freeing slaves and giving rights to slaves. It has nothing right. to do with religion clauses right. or anything of that nature. It has nothing yeah. to do with prayer in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And so they, they not only did they abuse the First Amendment, not only did they abuse Jefferson's statement, but they in the process abused in a massive way the 14th Amendment. Now, there was something called the Blaine Amendment seven years earlier. Uh, I think Blaine was either a member of the House or the Senate. I don't remember. I think he was from Connecticut. But he had passed, uh, not passed, but introduced legislation trying to get the religion clauses of the First Amendment to apply to the states via the 14th Amendment. Mm. And it was turned down. So what Hugo Black did is pass it anyway, <laughs> even though it had been debated by the people's representatives and rejected. Now, mm. Justice Learned Hand, in a case called Jaffrey versus Board of Commissioners, 1983, speaks to this issue. All right. I guess we're quoting here. The Blaine Amendment's defeat was a stark testimony to the fact that the adopters of the 14th Amendment never intended to incorporate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment against the states. Close quote. So the Blaine Amendment had been rejected mm. by the people's representatives. Well, Hugo Black applied it anyway. So I guess what I'm trying to show you is what a total knot Satan has tied everything up in. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, they're trashing the First Amendment. They're mm -hmm. trashing what Jefferson believed and said. And now they're trashing the 14th Amendment. Right. And it's like, what's left to be trashed? I mean, they've twisted and mutilated everything mm. to get the United States off of its Judeo-Christian underpinnings. Wow. And when the Supreme Court <clears throat> made those decisions in 1962 and 1963, guess what, Brother Jim? <laughs> they never cited a single precedent 
Now, why would they not cite a single precedent? Because there weren't any. there weren't any. They were making it up yeah. as they were going. Now, Just pulled a, out their magic wand. Yes, right? it's exactly right. It's like dealing with uh, amillennialists, essentially. <laughs> so, wow. essentially, a precedent is a similarly situated case. Mm -hmm. Like if you're arguing before the court, you try to anchor your argument in what a similar court did with a similar set of facts. That's sure. called precedent. Any, sure. any lawyer that's worth their salt understands the power of precedent, is always looking for precedent mm -hmm. as they're trying to make their argument. And if you don't, and there's an ancient principle in the law called stare decisis. It's a Latin term. And basically it means let precedent stand. Mm -hmm. Courts have always had a great deal of deference to precedent. Mm -hmm. Well, not the 1962-1963 court. They had no respect for stare decisis or precedent because <clears throat> they were making their own. Mm. Uh, in fact, they admit this in the Abington Township case, 1963. Quoting, finally in Ingle versus Vital or Vitale, only last year, these principles were so universally recognized that the court, without the citation of a single case, reaffirmed them, close quote. So no precedents were cited other than the pretzel that Hugo Black gave them, the ticking time bomb in 1947. Other than that, there are no precedents. It, it, I'm sorry. It's, no, it's please. Just, I'm sorry. This just <laughs> jumps out at me. It's like your teenager coming home and saying, I want to go do whatever. And parent says, well, would you, if they tell you to go jump off a cliff, are, are you going to do that because they told you to do that? Yeah. Well, that's what they're doing here. Yeah. Well, everybody says it's so. Yeah. And the other thing <laughs> is if you're an, an, a criminal investigator, forensics, crime scenes, you know, I've talked to people that do that kind of work, and they've told me that we don't try to develop a theory on the case too right, fast. Right, right. Because the problem is you fall in love with your theory. Exactly. And you try to make the evidence fit yeah. your theory. Yeah. Then it becomes a pride thing. Yeah. Well, it's so obvious mm -hmm. that what they did in 1962 and 1963 is they decided what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And then from there work backwards yeah. to come up with some evidence for it. Hmm. Well, there is no evidence for it. That's why they have to twist everything so severely. Now, this chart here was put together by David Barton, and it's a description of what subsequent courts did following 1962 to 1963. <laughs> how many pre-1947, pre-Hugo Black citations are there versus how many post-1947, mm -hmm. post-Hugo Black citations are there. Levitt versus Committee, 1973. And these are all cases continuing to attack Christianity in public life, mm -hmm. whether it be city councils opening with prayer or having the Ten Commandments on the wall in a schoolhouse, etc. Mm -hmm. Levitt uh, versus Committee, 1973. Zero pre-1947 citations. One, uh, excuse me, 18 post-1947 citations. You see the same pattern with committee mm -hmm. versus Ny Nyquist. One pre-1947 citation, 99 post-1947 citations. Stone versus Graham, that's what tore down the Ten Commandments in the schools. Zero pre-1947 citations. Nine post-1947 citations. Mm. Marsh versus Chambers, 1982. One pre-1947 citation. 32 post-1947 citations. Mm. And so this is what is so hilarious to me about justices that are appointed by conservative presidents. Mm -hmm. And they come before the Senate for their hearing. And the liberal senators say, are you going to respect settled law? Meaning, are you going to respect what the Supreme Court did in 1962, 1963 or not? Mm -hmm. Not telling anybody mm -hmm. that the 1962, 1963 courts trashed mm -hmm. settled law. Mm -hmm. They had no respect for settled law. Yeah. Yeah. And the Roe versus Wade court is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Are you going to respect settled law? 
well, how come you weren't asking that to the guys that were going to write Roe versus Wade? Exactly. Who trashed settled law. Now, I'm a graduate of a law school, mm. a member of the California Bar, and I studied constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And when we got to the religion sections of the First Amendment, do you know where the case book started with which case? It started in 1947 <laughs> with <course>. Hugo Black. <laughs> And so most attorneys know nothing, zero, about 1947 back to the War of Independence. It's almost like we had a War of Independence and then we had 1947. Mm -mm. And that whole history from 1776 to 1947 has been completely erased. Mm -hmm. And most attorneys function without even knowing anything about it. I didn't know anything about it until I started looking into it. Wow. Uh, and uh, I investigating it. Wow. So this takes us, Brother Jim, to number mm. seven. In the process, the United States Supreme Court erroneously believed in 1962 and 1963 that Christianity causes psychological damage. Right. Now, look at what they say <clears throat> here in the <throat> Abington <throat> case, 1963. All right, quoting. And this dealt with the volitional Bible reading in public schools. <laughs> yes, we can't read the Bible in public schools because of this. Quoting, But if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be, and in his specific experience with children, Dr. Gra I think that's Grazel observed, mm -hmm. had been, now he's saying children had been psychologically, it had been psychologically harmful to the child, that's reading the New Testament, and had caused a divisive force within the social media of the school, close quote. So they relied on some wow. expert witness that says wow. the Bible left uncommented wow. on could psychologically wow. damage children. Wow. Well, if that's what you believe, then obviously you work backward to try to make the facts fit your decision. Not one word here about how the Bible has psychologically helped people. Uh, yes. I mean, my experience <clears throat> is there isn't a book that's done more for my emotional well-being than the Bible. Yes. In terms of the negative emotions of bitterness, mm -hmm. anxiety. Yep. I mean, there isn't a book on planet Earth that's helped me more in those two areas than the Bible. Right. So how come they don't introduce any evidence on the psychological benefits of the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> mm. And what does Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 say? Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Yeah. The fear of the Lord. Now it doesn't say here, other verses say it, but not this introductory verse doesn't say the fear of the Lord is being a wisdom right. other verses say that yeah but right at the beginning of the book it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge mm -hmm. in other words if you want to be smart mm -hmm. you would submit yourself to the authority of God if you want to be educated and educated mm -hmm. so what happened mm -hmm. then brother Jim in 1962 and 1963 look at the SAT scores and that line there that's hmm. emboldened, the vertical line is the year that our Supreme Court did these things, mm -hmm. and look at the SAT scores before, mm -hmm. and look at the SAT scores after. Mm. In fact, some of this information I got from David Barton's book, Original Intent, and he has all kinds of graphs in there about how every cultural barometer that can be measured, whether it be divorce, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. suicide, teenage pregnancy, mm -hmm. the transmission of venereal diseases, every single one of those indicators went off the charts or in a negative direction mm -hmm. with that decision in 1962 yeah. and 1963. Now, why is that? Because of something that George Mason, <clears throat> who's known as the father of the Bill of Rights, said, as recorded in the papers of James Madison. What did George Mason say? This is very interesting. It is. All right, quoting. 
as nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, so they must be in this, by an inevitable chain of causes and effects. Providence punishes national sins by national calamities, close quote. His point is, is this, look, a human being has a soul. Mm -hmm. So they're judged in the next life. Sure. A country doesn't have a soul because mm -hmm. it's not an eternal entity like a human being is. Mm -hmm. So when countries go against God, God doesn't postpone judgment for the next life. He judges immediately. Right. And it's very interesting that almost every negative cultural indicator went off the charts mm -hmm. beginning in 1962 and 1963. It's almost yeah. like God immediately moved in with judgment mm -hmm. to the United States of America. Yeah. And see, we're living in the aftermath of all of this. Our country is falling apart, and we don't even understand why it mm -hmm. is falling apart. Yeah. Um, mm. So, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on this? I'm just wondering if George Mason have, must have... Uh, he must have read his Old Testament to figure this out because uh, you can see this played out in the Old Testament. Absolutely. Over Absolutely. and over again. Over and over. So this takes mm -hmm. us to, well, number seven was they erroneously believed that the Bible causes psychological damage. And this takes us to number eight of nine. The Supreme Court in 1962 and 1963, act, and we've dealt with this many times, this issue, acted as the Constitution's amender mm -hmm. rather than its interpreter mm -hmm. we yeah. know that according to mm -hmm. Isaiah 33 verse 22 that political power is exercised in only three ways do you mind reading that verse to us yes sir Isaiah 33 22 from the New American Standard 95 update for the Lord is our judge the Lord is our lawgiver the Lord is our king judge Close judicial quote. power interpreting the law Lawgiver, legislative power, mm -hmm. creating law, and king, executive power, enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine if God does all three, but you don't entrust all three, let alone two, to fallen human beings. Right. And if you do, you have tyranny on your hands. Yes, sir. And that's what James Madison said in Federalist Paper number 47. Yes, uh, quoting... The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Close quote. See, what the Supreme Court did by rewriting the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment in the manner in which they did it, they amended the Constitution from the bench. Mm -hmm. As a judicial body which is supposed to interpret law, they rewrote law. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson said, if you let the judges do this at the federal level, you'll be under an oligarchy. Mm -hmm. And what does he say there? And this is a letter he wrote, oh gosh, back in 1820. Mm -hmm. Quoting, You seem to consider judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the, de the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men, and not more so and their power the more dangerous as they are in office for life and not responsible as the other functionaries are to the elective control. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal. Close quote. So you get judges into the position of, re of amending the Constitution, you're under an oligarchy. Mm. Oligarchy means rule by a few. Mm. Yeah. And they're particularly dangerous because you can't vote them out. Yeah. Because at the federal level, it's a lifetime appointment. Yeah. And he warned that if the judges start doing this, this is what they do with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It would become like a mere thing of wax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what does he say there? Yeah. He's... In his letter to Judge Spencer Roan, 1819. Yeah, he says it would become a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary which they may twist and shape into any form they please, close quote. Now, George Washington warned about the same thing. Judges 
amending the Constitution from the bench, which is what they did in 1962 and 1963, as, yeah. as we've tried to explain. You know, they turned the Establishment Clause into something that it was never intended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, if they want to change it, then let it go through the amendment process. Yes. They didn't do that, though. Right. So George Washington warned what would happen if you turn, if you give that power to judges. Mm. Mm -mm. Yeah, folks, are you noticing that we're quoting all these lightweights, <laughs> yeah. like George Washington, for example? Right. Quoting, if in the opinion of the people, the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be at any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment the way the Constitution designates. But let there be no change by usurpation, though this may in one instance be the instrument of good. It is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed, close quote. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people will say, well, the judges have done some good in the past. <laughs> yeah. And George Washington yeah. says that's not the issue. That's exactly right. What could be done for good, the same power can be used for evil. That's exactly right. And if you turn that loose, he says that's the customary weapon mm -hmm. by which free governments are destroyed. This is why we're losing the culture war. All of these decisions, like whether America is going to be a Christian nation or not, are now in the hands of judges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they knew what they were talking about. When he says customary <laughs> weapon, they knew what they were talking about because they just come out of that. Just come out of the war. Now, David Barton in his book, The Myth of Separation, makes an amazing observation about the background of the jurists, the judges, I guess we call them justices at the Supreme Court level in 1962 and 1963. All of them come from political backgrounds. <laughs> All right. For example, Chief Justice Earl Warren had been the governor of California for 10 years prior to his appointment to the court. Justice Hugo Black had been a U.S. Senator for 10 years prior to his appointment. Justice Felix Frankfurter had been an assistant to the Secretary of Labor and a founding member of the ACLU. Whoops. Justice Arthur Goldberg had been the Secretary of Labor and ambassador to the United Nations. Justice William Douglas was chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. All the justices except Potter Stewart had similar political backgrounds. Justice Potter Stewart, having been a federal judge for four years prior to his appointment, was the only member of the court with extended federal constitutional experience before his appointment. Interestingly, Justice Potter Stewart was the only <laughs> justice who objected to the removal of prayer on the basis of precedent. He alone acted as a judge. The rest acted as politicians, close quote. See, that's an important observation because all those important. judges, jurists in 1962, 1963, they came from either the legislative or executive branch of government, and so they just kept acting like that yeah. on, on the, in the judiciary. They didn't understand their job. Exactly. Mm. And the only guy that acted like a judge mm. was a guy that didn't come from those other branches of government. Mm. And these are things wow. we need to watch. I mean, yes. who, who, who's being appointed to the Supreme Court? Yes. And so we have this uh, quip, mm. infamous mm. quip, during the Warren Court era attributed to William Douglas, and he says of the Supreme Court, with five votes we can do anything. That's scary. Because you really only need five for a majority yeah. opinion. Yeah. And, and this is why we're losing the culture war. This is why we're a humanistic country today and no longer founded on a Judeo-Christian uh, foundation. Mm. Now, Lino Groglia, in, a law professor in the South Texas Law Journal, all the way back in 1985, makes the same observation about the out-of-control judiciary. And what does he say here in this quote? All right, quoting... Judicial usurpation of legislative power has become common and so complete that the Supreme Court has become our most powerful and important instrument of government in terms of determining the nature and power of American life. Questions literally of life and death, for example, abortion and capital punishment, of public morality, 
for example, control of pornography, prayer in the schools, and government aid to religious schools. And of the public safety, for example, criminal procedure and street demonstrations are all now in the hands of judges under the guise of constitutional law. The fact that the Constitution says nothing of abortion has made no difference. The result is that the central truth of constitutional law today is that it has nothing to do with the Constitution except that the words due process or equal protection are almost always used by the judges in stating their conclusions. Constitutional law has become a fraud, a cover for a system of government by the majority vote of a nine-person committee of lawyers unelected and holding office for life." Close quote. Well, I, don't, I think that Ooh. about says it all. It, yeah. How do you follow that up? Right. Constitutional law has nothing to do with the Constitution, mm. except no. they just keep saying separation of church right. and state when the people never <coughs> voted for framing the First Amendment that way. And we have no recourse. And we have no recourse. Um, poor Anthony Scalia, mm. who was one of the lone voices there, I think Clarence Thomas is also one of the lone voices, mm. and it looks like Samuel yeah. Alito is sort of shaping up to be one of the lone voices, but when Scalia was alive, he was, you know, he just, there's a book called Scalia Dissent, mm. and it's just got all his dissenting opinions, because he was complaining about this all of the time, mm -hmm. yet he was in the minority, yeah. and what could he do other than complain? Yeah. So what does he say mm -hmm. in this particular case in a dissenting opinion? This is classic Scalia right here. All right, quoting, What secret knowledge, one must wonder, is breathed into lawyers when they become members of this court that enables them to discern that a practice which the text of the Constitution does not clearly prescribe and which our people have regarded as constitutional for 200 years is in fact unconstitutional. Day by day, case by case, the court is busy designing a constitution for a country I do not recognize." Close quote. Yeah, and I didn't know the court was supposed to be designing a constitution. Exactly. I thought we already had a constitution. Yes. And so my eighth point here is in 1962, 1963, the court acted as the Constitution's amender mm -hmm. rather than its interpreter. And this takes us to the last one. And mm. I know we've gone a little bit long here today, folks, but to unseat a cultural myth requires, you know, a lot of care, diligence, and methodical study mm -hmm. and presentation yeah. and putting it in a way that hopefully people can understand it. But this ninth point may be the most important of everything we've said. Number nine, the ninth problem with what the court did in 1962 and 1963 is the Supreme Court mm. of the United States selectively mm. took their newly created separation between church and state doctrine and applied it only and exclusively to Judeo-Christian truth and gave every other mm. religion a free pass. Mm. Wow. So what applies to the Bible, in terms of purging it from public life, mm -hmm. doesn't apply to the New Age, yeah. doesn't apply to Islam, doesn't apply to uh, what's called secular humanism. Mm -hmm. Now, the New Agers are just as religious as we are. They sure are. And what does uh, this particular individual, John Dunphy, say, writing in The Humanist? All right. Quoting, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classrooms by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call the divinity in every human being. 
These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preachers, close quote. So we're going to take over the public schools and we're going to use them in, to indoctrinate the next generation yep. into the religion of the New Age movement. Yeah. Now, where is the separation of church and state for that? Mm. Doesn't No one talks about it anymore. No. Yeah. Mm -mm. Islam, the same way. Yep. They want to go right into the schools and use it to promote Islam. Uh, here's an article from World Net Daily talking about this. All right. In the wake of September 11th, an increasing number of California public school students must attend an intensive three-week course on Islam, reports Assist News Service. The course mandates that seventh graders learn the tenets of Islam, study the important figures of the faith, wear a robe, adopt a Muslim name, and stage their own jihad. Students must memorize many verses in the Quran, are taught to pray, quote, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, close quote, and are instructed to chant, quoting, praise to Allah, Lord of creation, close quote. And keep going if you can. That ought to infuriate you. Yes. It's infuriating me. Quoting, we could never teach Christianity like this, one outraged parent told ANS. We can't even mention the name of Jesus in public schools. But they teach Islam as the true religion, and students are taught about Islam and how to pray to Allah. Could you imagine the barrage and problems we would have from the ACLU if Christianity were taught in the public schools and if we tried to teach about the contributions of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Apostle Paul? But when it comes to furthering the Islamic religion in public schools, there is not one word from the ACLU, People for the American Way, or anybody else. This is hypocrisy. Continuing, this is not just a class of examining culture. The course is entirely too specific. It is more about indoctrination. The textbook used for the Islamic courses, entitled Across the Centuries, is published by Hofton Mifflin and has been adopted by the California school system. In it, according to ANS, Islam is presented broadly in a completely positive manner, whereas the limited references to Christianity are, quote, shown in a negative light with the events such as the Inquisition and the Salem witch hunts highlighted in bold black type. ANS notes the portrayal of Islam leaves out uh, word of the, quote, wars, massacres, cruelties against Christians, and other non-Muslims that Islam has consistently perpetrated over the centuries, close quote. So let's take the New Age movement and bring it into the schools. No one uses separation of church and state to ban it. Let's take Islam and bring it into the schools. No one uses the strict wall of separation right. between church and state to ban it. You get the idea that this doctrine was created only for Christians. Hmm, yeah. Yeah. And of course, I believe that the public schools, people say the Supreme Court threw religion out of the public schools. No, they mm. did not. They, no, they threw didn't. a religion out. Mm -hmm. The public schools are as religious as they've always been. Yeah. They're just teaching a religion called humanism. Mm -hmm. Dr. John Eidsmo in his Christian legal advisor summarizes the religions of humanism as follows. Do you mind reading those? All right. First of all, the non-existence or Ill irrelevancy of God. Point number two, man is the center of all things. Number three, the reality of evolution. Number four, man is an evolved animal rather than a special creature made in the image of God, of his creator. Uh, five, the absence of an ab any absolute morals or values. Six, confidence in the scientific method to solve the world's problems. Now, th those are just as much faith presuppositions well, then, as in any doctrine we believe related to the Bible. That's a doctrinal statement. It's, yeah, exactly. So where's the wall of separation where's, between yeah, church and state? Where's the separation? The interesting thing about humanism is it answers mm -hmm. life's most fundamental questions, mm -hmm. just like Christianity does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christianity, who am I? Well, you're a special creation of God. Where did I come from? From God's design. 
Why am I here? To know and glorify God. Where am I going? Going to heaven. How can I get there? Only through Jesus Christ. Right. Humanists have the same faith-based answers to all of those fundamental questions. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Biological accident. Where did I come from? From the primordial soup. Why am I here? To fulfill self. Mm -hmm. Where am I going? Towards a new planetary consciousness and new world order. How can I get there? <laughs> How can I get there? The uh, scientific method. In fact, Paul Kurtz of the Humanist Society, in his books, uh, and I've, I've read them, Humanist mm. Manifesto 1 and Humanist Manifesto 2, he calls humanism a religion. He yeah. calls it the advancement of a religion, mm -hmm. religious humanists, uh, religious humanism. Mm -hmm. In fact, Dr. Norman Geisler, an evangelical, was called as an expert witness in a trial that was done, I believe, in Arkansas. And it dealt with a situation where a school wanted to teach creationism alongside evolution, mm -hmm. you know, balanced treatment. Mm -hmm. And of course you can't do that. That violates the strict wall of separation between church and state. We should only teach evolution. And Dr. Geisler, and in this particular book, Creation in the Courts, 80 Years of Conflict in the Classroom and the Courtroom, contains the transcript where he was gave his expert testimony as to why humanism, evolutionary-based humanism, is just as much a religion as is Christianity. Mm -hmm. Do you mind reading that transcript to us? All right. <laughs> it's, it's a little long, folks. Bear with me. Yeah, we're Quote, wrapping up, though. First of all, this is the Humanist Manifestos 1 and 2, which were published in 1933 and 1973, respectively. And this particular edition comes from Chromtheus, Prometheus Books, which publishes a lot of, fun, of rather humanistic material. In the preface, it says on the very first line of page 3, quote, Humanism is a philosophical, religious, and moral point of view as old as human civilization itself, quote, uh, close quote. Then, without reading more of this part, I counted some 28 times in the first manifesto the use of the word religion, most of which was a positive use describing a humanist point of view. Then if you note on page 4, in the last paragraph, there are about four lines down, it says, uh, there are about four lines down, it says, there, th quoting, they are not intended as new dogmas, close quote, referring to this manifesto, quote, for an age of confusion, but as the expression of a quest for values and goals that we can work for and that can help us to take a new direction, close quote. Continuing, Humanists are committed to building a world that is significant, not only for the individual's quest for meaning, but for the whole humankind. I think that's a good description of what I discovered a religion to be. They describe it as a religion. It is a commitment to something that is of transcendent value for them. Then I noted on the first page, that is page 7, Really, Humanist 1 on the bottom, it speaks several times on that page, line 2, religion, line 5, religion, down through the page about six times. And the last line refers to abiding values. Continuing. Then on the next page, page 8, the first full paragraph at the end of that paragraph, the third line from the end of the paragraph reads, quote, To establish such a religion is a major necessity of the present. It is the responsibility which rests upon this generation. We therefore affirm the following. And then they give their humanistic beliefs. So the humanistic manifesto claims to be an expression of a religion called humanism that has certain component parts that they describe. See, Close quote. everybody thinks the public schools are neutral. They're not neutral There's at no all. Neutrality. They're teaching the religion of humanism. That's and right. I think Geisler as an expert witness, you know, is very careful and good at pointing that out. Yes. Now, in Torcaso versus Watkins, 1961, in a footnote, the Supreme Court 
actually acknowledged that humanism is a religion. What did they say there? Quoting, among the religions in this country which do not teach what would generally be considered a belief in the existence of God are Buddhism, Taoism, ethical culture, secular humanism, and others, close quote. Now notice it calls secular humanism a religion. It sure does. So don't let the word secular fool you into right. thinking it's not religious. Right. I mean, the public schools are basically seminaries, is what they are. They they're, are. They're preparing the next generation of priests yes. in the humanist religion. Mm. In fact, here is a quote from Charles Francis Potter in a book written in 1930. The title of the book was Humanism, a New Religion, and he telegraphs exactly what they were going to do. Yeah, he doesn't hold back, does he? All right, quoting, Education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism, and every public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools, meeting for an hour once a week, and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? Close quote. Here's what he says. We're going to take there over the teachers' colleges. We're going to take over the public schools. And we're going to teach humanism around the clock. And the fundamentalists and the Bible believers that have their kids in Sunday school once a week will never be able to keep we'll up. have a chance. And we'll take over the next generation. And he is a minister, according to the oh my information goodness. there. Yeah, he minister, is a minister. Minister. Mm -hmm. Now... Here's something else that's interesting about what you just pointed out, him being a minister. The humanist society has 501c3 tax-exempt status. Interesting. So they're a tax-exempt religious organization. They get to teach their religion in the schools. We have tax-exempt religious standing. We can't teach our religion in the public schools. Yeah. And here we are as Bible believers and fundamentalists wondering why we're losing America yeah. and why we're losing our youth. Right. I mean, they told us what they were going to do. They did. And they did. It. And while we were having church potlucks, they went and mm. stole it. Yeah. And they largely right. did it through wayward Supreme Court rulings. Mm. So sort of by way of review, I mean... I hope people are starting to see how badly they've been ripped off in 1962 and 1963. Yeah. The court read words into the First Amendment that aren't there. Number two, they relied upon and took out of context a letter written by Thomas Jefferson more than a decade after the Constitution was created. Number three, they ignored the legislative activities of those who authored the First Amendment. Yeah. Number four, they applied the First Amendment to the states, although the First Amendment describes itself only as a limitation on federal power. Number five, they ignored the original intent of the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's left not to manipulate and twist? Yeah. Number six, they failed to cite a single precedent. Number seven, they erroneously believe that Christianity causes psychological damage. Mm -hmm. Number eight, they acted as the Constitution's amender rather mm -hmm. than its interpreter. Mm -hmm. And number nine, they selectively applied their newly created separation doctrine only to Judeo-Christian truth while giving alternative non-Christian religions a virtual free pass, not one word against the humanists, no. not one word against the New Agers, no. not one word against Islam. No. Now, Justice Rehnquist, who at this time I believe was the Chief Justice to the United States Supreme Court, in a dissenting opinion, I think this is a dissenting opinion, criticizes the metaphor, separation of church and state, up one side and down the other. <laughs> and when you look at these quotations, I want you to understand, these aren't coming from Andy Woods and Jim McGowan. <laughs> right. This is coming from the Chief Justice. And what's some of the language that he uses? All right, he says, the absence of a historical basis for this rigid theory of separation. He says, not wholly accurate can only be dimly perceived. I like that one. You have to be a dimwit. I, I'm sorry. It's lack of historical support, all but useless as a guide to sound constitutional application. 
It illustrates all too well Benjamin Cardozo's observation that metaphors in law are to be narrowly watched for starting as devices to liberate thought, they end often in enslaving it. Isn't that what we've been describing? Pretty good. Mischievous diversion of judges from the actual intentions of the drafters of the Bill of Rights. No amount of repetition of historical errors in judicial opinions can make the errors true. Hello! A metaphor based on bad history. A metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. Now, I love this quote here from Ann Coulter. Uh, I'm not a endorser of everything that Ann Coulter says and does. Uh, But this particular quote, I think, is outstanding. She writes, First they claim there is no place for religion in the public square. And then they expand the public square to include everything. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that the loudest voices wanting this strict wall of separation between church and state is the same crowd that wants the government to get bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and get its tentacles into every area of life. Sure. To me, what they're doing is they're designing a country, if not a world, without God in it at all. Sure. And yeah. have yeah. a nice afternoon, folks. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think the first thing you have to understand to fight back is understand what's happened to you. Right, right. Now, on prior pastors' points of views, number 40 through 44, we talked about some practical ways to rein in a out-of-control judiciary, which we won't repeat here, but you can watch those shows to figure out what we think is a solution. But I don't know, Brother Jim. I just think on Independence Day, we ought to be thinking about things like this. Yeah. You know, as we look backward and are thankful for our country, but we're looking at today saying, what happened? And we're looking at tomorrow and saying, where is this whole thing going? And what kind of future are our children and grandchildren going to enjoy? Mm -hmm. Don't you think these are appropriate? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Independence Day thoughts. Do you have any closing remarks? Well, I'm I'm just thinking, you know, if you don't think this is serious, just uh, look around in your area and find out how many churches are going to actually have some type of a uh, independence sermon where they actually teach something of value. Yeah. You'd be well, surprised. We're going to have it here at Sugarland Bible Church. That was a good segue. Wasn't yeah. It? In fact, we're going to have so much of it, I may be the last man standing. Because <laughs> we're going to go through the principles that made America great. I have to do it in yes. two sessions. Yeah. So we're going to do it in Sunday school, and what we don't finish in Sunday school, we're going to complete in the main service Can't wait. starting uh, this Sunday, July the 5th at 9.45 a.m., the main service starting you know, roughly 11.30 a.m. So I encourage people to catch us on live stream. Amen. And I'll tell you what, uh, Brother Jim, we could use some prayer because you and I are going to be at KHCB this evening mm-hmm. from 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. Central, answering live Bible questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do us a favor, folks. Send us some questions. Yeah. Call in or we can't have a show. Yeah. Um, so you can find the KHCB app. Mm-hmm. And, of course, if you're in the Houston area, you can get KHCB you know, on, on uh, terrestrial mm-hmm. uh, live radio. Yeah, you can also get it through the internet and just listen directly on yeah. your computer. Yeah. yeah, and go just go to their website, KHCB, keeping him close by. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I think um, we've got enough food for thought for I think, now. I think, I, think so. think, I think we'll say goodbye. So just be in prayer for our country. Yes. Be like the men of Issachar, you know, who understood the times. Mm. Yeah. And as a result of understanding the times, they knew what to do. Yeah. I think a lot of the problem is we don't understand the times. Great point. So this has been kind of a difficult session to, to teach and probably hear, but we're just trying to alert people to the times that we're living in and the, the right. seriousness of our moment. So right. thoughts to keep in mind as we, we celebrate Independence Day. Thanks yes. for watching. We'll see you next time. God, God bless you. Me.